Welcome uh, to the atomic advanced atomic as an option uh, panel. In this second day of uh, the, uh, the fuel options that we're discussing in the 2021 Green for Sea Forum. Now, advanced atomic is an issue uh, existing for many years. Uh, however, in shipping, this idea uh, we think is maturing, arriving uh, uh, with a very promising fourth generation reactors. With the use of advanced atomic ships, will not be releasing any sort of emissions as there are no shocks, NOx, CO2, or particulates, or anything. In fact, considering the full energy cycle, atomic is millions of times more power dense and cleaner compared to other, to other fossil fuels or popular alternatives in the likes of methanol, ammonia, and hydrogen. We have to also bear in mind that approximately 30% of the world power generation comes out of atomic uh, energy. So this is nothing new. And however, we would like to discuss that this, uh, the promise of the fourth generation reactors it makes it a very attractive option for a number of reasons that we will discuss. Now, what's on the agenda on the panel? Like all the other panels of, of this day, we would like to discuss market momentum, any sort of milestone or success stories that we have to, to bear in mind, key challenges, drivers and barriers, CAPEX, OPEX consideration and real life examples. And more or less, we would like to see the competitive strengths and weaknesses of advanced atomic against other options. Now, in order to have this discussion, we have a, a, a panel of experts. Let me introduce them to you. We have Panos Zahariadis, who is a technical director of Atlantic Bulk Carriers, an operator of uh, bulk carriers, one of the leading operators actually of dry bulk uh, across the globe. Edmund Hughes, director of Green Marine Associates, previously with the IMO, a known face across the industry. And last but not least, Giulio Gennaro, who is the technical director of Core Power, a technology provider <clears throat> for Advanced Atomic. Gentlemen, I would like to welcome you to this panel. And as we first have this first order of business out of the agenda, I would like to ask you to commence with a set of presentations. Panos, if you could be kind enough to share your screen and let us have your presentation. Okay, most of my presentation is, is going to deal with why we need nuclear. Uh, this is one of the reasons. This is... Uh, the uh, greenhouse warming potential of natural gas when it is released to the atmosphere. Uh, the first five to 10 years, uh, one kilo of methane is worse than 110 kilos of CO2, for example. So what we hear uh, to come down from the clouds that methane LNG is 25 times worse than CO2 is not right, it is actually 86 times uh, more potent uh, for global warming. And of course, when an engine burns LNG, it doesn't really produce less CO2 than conventional fuels. It produces the same or worse uh, than diesel fuel. This is, um, these are the most popular uh, engines that burn LNG. And you can see that they are over 5% uh, uh, more CO2 emissions than uh, diesel. Uh, and this is based on the claims of the manufacturers themselves and not using the 86 factor that I talked about before, but just using a factor of 30. Now we have heard that high pressure ignition engines have uh, much less uh, methane slip actually unburned methane escaping to the atmosphere after combustion. Uh, but if you apply the factor of 86, as I mentioned before, which is the factor for what happens 20 years after the methane escapes to the atmosphere, then those engines also become worse than conventional diesel engines. And if you want to look at it from a lifetime point of view, uh, diesel on the right side and uh, conventional gas and shale gas on the left. Some bits from recent news. Uh, new studies come out continuously saying LNG is not as good as we thought it is. Um, on the latest study, the most popular LNG ship engines actually emit 70 to 82% more greenhouse gases than distillate fuels. Maersk 
rules out LNG as transitional fuel. And the Green Lobby now lately is saying switching SIPs to LNG is worse than doing nothing. What about other alternative fuels, hydrogen and ammonia? Now, hydrogen and ammonia, they also come from natural gas. 95% of hydrogen production comes from natural gas through a process called steam methane reforming, which is very carbon intensive. The, uh, just for producing hydrogen right now, the emissions of producing hydrogen is eight, 830 million tons CO2 per year, which is the same as all of shipping. Consider that hydrogen uh, production is only 75 million tons. Methanol is the same thing, um, comes from natural gas through steam methane reforming. Uh, methanol's world production is about double that of hydrogen, about 150 uh, million tons. And therefore you can double the numbers. Uh, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's also very carbon intensive. This is uh, a diagram from an IMO publication. Uh, we thought that me methanol from biomass uh, uh, may be better, but based on this graph, um, uh, you can see that even uh, methanol from uh, biomass from Finland, which uses quite a bit of renewable electricity, uh, the blue bars on the right side is also uh, quite high. To those blue bars on the right side, you have to add the green uh, bar of methanol. In, and at least I can see that all of them exceed uh, heavy fuel oil and, and MGO. Uh, what I'm trying to say is that is, is not easy. We're not there yet with all those alternative fuels to address global warming. Let's look at batteries. One ton of diesel has an energy capacity of 11,700 watt hours per kilogram. The best lithium battery we have is 300 watt hours per kilogram. So a container ship going at its most economical speed from Asia to Europe would need to have on board 100,000 tons of batteries to make the trip. Um, renewables are, as you see here, very intermittent. This is summer in the United Kingdom, and that's winter in the United Kingdom, a lot more wind, but uh, plenty of periods of insufficient uh, renewable energy. Another reason, you can see the energy density of uranium and thorium at the top, and you can see the energy densities of hydrogen, LNG, crude oil, and diesel oil, ammonia at the bottom. We're talking about 40, 000, uh, 40 million and 23 million times more for uranium and thorium. So that's my only slide that deals with the actual fourth generation mini reactors. We can discuss more. Uh, during the discussion. There is no possibility of a meltdown. In many of them, uh, the fuel is already molten. Uh, so what meltdown are we talking about? One of the reasons is they don't need any water pumps uh, that, that can stop if you have an electric blackout. Uh, so they cool with natural cooling. They are designed so that they never exceed. They can never physically exceed a maximum temperature. Their radioactive remains are much reduced, 300 years of radioactivity versus 300,000 years of current reactors. They can use spent radioactive waste from our current reactors, or they can use nuclear weapons which are now stored, and we don't know what to do with them. They can use them as fuel. They can have very small in capacity, 10 to 50 megawatts, 25 year life, totally enclosed, maintenance free for the crew. They can be much cheaper than diesel engine plus a few years of fuel. And if you don't want to put a nuclear reactor on your ship, they can be used to produce incredible amounts and cheap amounts of green hydrogen without electrolysis because of the high temperatures. So that was my presentation. I thank you very much.
Thank you very much, uh, Panos, for the introductory thoughts on, on why we should, let's say, consider uh, advanced atomic. Uh, Edmund, uh, can you share your screen, please, and let us have your presentation? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. And, and it was very, very helpful to follow Panos there. I, I thought it gave a very, very succinct explanation of where the challenges for this uh, sector is. And I, and I personally, since um, you know, I left the IMO back in uh, February last year, I mean, I, I, I've taken a great deal of interest in the developments that are going on in terms of nuclear propulsion of ships, because I think, I think what there is still, frankly, a, a degree of denial in the industry about what is the challenge here. And, uh, you know, in terms of we are in the process, not just in terms of reducing our carbon uh, footprint as a sector, uh, as the vision in the initial IMO strategy says uh, to eliminate that, uh, to decarbonize the sector by the end of the century. So you're talking about 80 years uh, period, but, but actually we're in an energy transition. Uh, and, and that energy transition requires enormous amounts of alternative energy. Uh, Panos has highlighted some of those sources, potential sources, which are being considered currently by the sector. But to be frank, I think the, the amount of energy that's needed to propel the biggest machines on the planet really is, 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 a, is a challenge that, that one is, we cannot ignore nuclear power. I, I, I just think it's, it's something, a proven technology, a proven energy source, one that we can manage and certainly, as Panos has already alluded, alluded to, the, the fourth generation uh, technologies are, are, are going to potentially provide a, a solution, uh, whether it be di through direct propulsion or through uh, land-based uh, energy sources to develop the electrofuels. Um, and, and, and the reason why is simply, and, and I was, was going to just briefly allude to the, the IMO initial strategy, and, and obviously that set really a, a framework for action going forward for the in international shipping sector. And, and the importance of that, it, it sends a, a couple of things, sends a clear message of intent from the governments of the world to the sector that, that they want to see the sector decarbonise in this century. And, and, and that what, the reason why, and we have to go back to the Paris Agreement and, and, and the importance of the Paris Agreement, where the goal set, uh, you know, talked about well below two degree temperature rise with an aim to be one and a half degrees above post-industrial levels. And now when you already consider that we're about one degree above post-industrial uh, temperature and just the other day uh, the, 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 the announcement that the Keeling curve now is showing 420 parts per million uh, in the atmosphere of CO2. I mean I, I can remember just literally a few years back it was just part where there was a big announcement about it being above 400 and we're all up to 420 and, and frankly that, that's quite a shocking development because what it can potentially tell you is that the, the, the natural resources of the world are potentially absorbing less carbon dioxide just as the oceans. The oceans have absor already absorbed enormous amounts of CO2 and, and they made those those ability to absorb that that excess CO2 may be declining. I don't know, I'm not a scientist, but, uh, but, uh, but it may be the case. And, and so the urgency is there. And frankly, you know, we as a sector have to act because if we don't act, uh, you know, we, we're already hearing noises about people not being able to invest in the sector because it's not acting fast enough. Or, or frankly, we just want the success, the, success, the sector, which has already been an enormous success in, in supporting global trade and commerce over the last 50 years. We want that sector to continue to thrive. And for us to do that, it has to address climate change. It has to uh, bring in, uh, you know, zero uh, carbon fuels. And, and, and as Panos rightly said, you know, nuclear power presents a solution which is zero emission, a true zero emission solution. And as I said before, the, the strategy sets out the, the clear uh, parameters in which we have to work. And in particular, the, 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 the third level of ambition where we want to peak GHG emissions from international shipping as soon as possible and to reduce the total annual GHG emissions by at least 50% by 2050 compared to 2008. And, and this, this is not, again, this is not a net zero target. This is an absolute emission target. So we're reducing from about 800 million tonnes of CO2 annually um, down to 400 million tonnes annually. And that, as I say, is a stage towards the vision in the strategy, which is decarbonisation of the sector by the end of, end of the century. So it's an enormous challenge for us uh, and, and the sector. And, and what it is doing is leading to uh, this fourth propulsion revolution. And, and we are aware of, of all the various types of fuel and the technologies that are being considered the ammonias, the hydrogens, the electric, 
uh, for, pr predominantly for short sea. I think Panos again <laughs> clearly demonstrated why electric for deep sea is not really an option. Uh, it's not, but you know, all these factors are there and, and all these issues are having to be discussed and they all bring risks. Isn't it? And, and I think again, that's something we have to uh, really begin to uh, get a handle on and understand is that there's going to be no zero such thing as a zero risk option here, particularly when you're talking about deep sea ships. You know, when you're talking about hydrogen, it's highly explosive. You're talking about ammonia, highly corrosive, highly toxic. You know, the, these things are not zero risk uh, solutions. And so any solution we find and any solution we come to, there is going to be risk. And I would advocate and suggest that, that we do understand the risks of nuclear very well. We understand there are risks. Let's not be in denial about that. There are risks. However, the fourth generation, the advanced nuclear reactors, again, as Panos has already alluded to, you know, they, they have essential inherent safety over what are the pressure water reactor technology which are currently seen in, 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 in power generation, uh, predominantly in large power stations ashore. And again, that's one of the advantages of the advanced nuclear uh, reactors. They can be built in modular and they can be smaller and therefore they are can potentially be much more economic as a solution. Uh, and, and to that effect, I know here in the UK, for example, the UK have, have set out a green program of, of investment, including uh, the development of these advanced nuclear reactors and, and companies like Rolls-Royce uh, are in the UK are, are already uh, looking at developing these along with, uh, I know Gennaro has spoken later and, and he, he'll talk about what Core Power are doing. Um, so nuclear is there and I think, I think you know, we, we, we can't ignore it. We need to really consider it as potential solution here. And, and, and certainly I know talking to some of the advocates about it, they are very clear that, that some of the uh, big sort of question marks over the economy, economics of, of nuclear power on ships can be addressed through, through, through sort of leasing models, but I'm sure uh, that will be discussed further. So why is it a big issue for shipping? I mean, the volumes of fuel that are needed, uh, the scale is needed. We, we, had, we had to address this matter as part of the IMO 2020 rule, and, and we could see the amount of uh, concern there was about fuel availability globally. So, you know, certainly if you're talking about deep sea shipping you, and the tramp trades, you need to have fuel available globally. And, and that question is very much there for those alternative fuels that are being considered, such as ammonia and hydrogen. What is the infrastructure to supply those fuels? Sustainability, the energy to produce these fuels. I mean, at the moment, yes, you can potentially use these fuels, but what, what energies do you use to produce those fuels? And, and likewise, if you're thinking about biofuels, for example, what about the feedstocks for those biofuels? And, and, and frankly, with biofuels, I would suggest that other sectors such as aviation are going to be ha do have deeper pockets and are going to be in the market before shipping for those fuels. Um, and then there's the lifestyle considerations, which have gone already been alluded to. And I think this uh, slide here from the European uh, Commission, published in 2016, gives a very good example of why nuclear power needs to be considered. And to that, again, to that effect, I noticed the other day there is now growing lobby pressure uh, for the EU. And there was a report from the Joint Research Centre in the EU to actually use uh, to, to, to classify nuclear as a green investment. Uh, because people are beginning to understand that, you know, there's something that we do need to consider seriously and, and take on board. So, you know, and this shows you clearly from a, from a, a life cycle assessment where nuclear power is, a, is advantageous over other potential fuels that may be used in the marine environment. So from a point of the regulatory framework, it isn't new. Uh, the IMO did have, uh, or does have, I should say, under chapter eight of SOLAS in, for uh, nuclear ships. And, and this is complemented by the IMO resolution a491, the Code of Safety for Nuclear Merchant Ships, and also the International Safety Management Code, obviously there to help manage risk uh, and safety risks uh, from the ship. There's also the IMO, IAEA safety recommendations on the use of ports by nuclear merchant ships. Uh, there was an IMO convention on liability, but that didn't enter into force. And, and then more recently, uh, there's a protocol to amend the Paris Again Convention about nuclear substances, which uh, uh, is under, which is hopefully going to be uh, enter into uh, force next year. Now. The, the key thing about all this regulatory framework is that much of it is, is frankly very old. It's 50 years old in terms of its development and, uh, and because its focus is on pressure water reactive technology uh, as opposed to the new advanced technologies. And so clearly there would be a need to review and revise this, uh, this, uh, this regulatory framework to, if we're going to be able to employ and deploy nuclear uh, uh, technologies on board ships going forward. Um, but it's certainly something that can be done. Thank you for your attention, ladies and gentlemen. I really hope to have a good discussion in the panel. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Edmund. Uh, um, extremely uh, well presented. Uh, uh, comes along with the panel's presentation. So, 
Julio, you don't have to sell us the idea now. You just have to explain the technology. So, well, I, I think that Panos and Edmund have already said most of what I would say. So I hopefully I will not be too boring. Thank you, Apostolos, Panos and Edmund, and all, all the people listening to us today. I will briefly talk about our solution, a zero emission re energy revolution and a game changer for transport and industry. Now, as we, as we have discussed the shipping, but not only shipping as to decarbonize, <clears throat> and the strategy to decarbonize is to electrify all that can be electrified and to produce electric power with clean sources. And as we have said, advanced atomic will play a fundamental role in this clean electric power generation. But there, is, there are also segments of the, of, the, of the economy like shipping, but also cement and steel making and chemical industry that cannot be electrified. And so we should use advanced atomic to produce power for all these segments. And coming to shipping alone, the worldwide fleet burns about 340 million tons per year of heavy fuel oil equivalent, emitting about 1 billion tons per year of CO2 equivalent. And this is just direct emissions. And then we have all the indirect emissions that are not only, let's say, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, because we always have to remember that greenhouse gas emissions are part of the emissions, that we have SOx, particulate matters, NOx, that create mortality and morbidity. So climate change is one aspect, but it's not the only aspect that we need to consider. Now, the unique proposition of, of molten salt reactor is that they are, as, as Panos also highlighted, they are modular, small scale, let's say battery-like power core that can be fitted in ships and in floating installations. As far as safety, they are passive walk away safe. And if we run uh, some, um, some model, some calculation, we understand that they are the cheapest and most efficient way to produce green hydrogen or green ammonia and methanol for the ships or for the, also for the land-based industry where we cannot directly install them to provide, to provide power. We talk about also the energy density, which is much higher to million uh, times more dense than diesel engine. And this type of nuclear reactor are much more efficient than normal, let's say conventionally known pressurized water reactor. So basically we can fully utilize the fuel and we in this way we leave minimal waste behind basically we reduce the waste of a pressurized water reactor by 20 times and we can also use the reactors by burn the waste of pressurized water reactor and also as panos has highlighted we can provide power in the range of 50 to uh, 15 to 50 megawatt electric with a life cycle of about 30 years. That means that this type of reactor do not need to be refueled for the entire life of the ship, which is a great advantage. Now, as core power, we have partnered with Terra Power, Southern Company and Orano, and we have formed what is considered like the world leading molten salt reactor consortium we are working on the molten chloride fast reactor, which is a type of molten salt reactor. And this technology has been developed by Terra Power, which is the world's leading atomic innovation company uh, founded by, by Bill Gates. In December, uh, we have been awarded 90 million US dollar by the Department of Energy to develop a prototype of the molten chloride fast reactor. And our role as core power in this consortium is the commercialization and the, uh, the marinization and regulatory aspects. So what, what are the advantages? I mean, I'm repeating what Panos has, has already said, but so with uh, atomic power, we can supply safe, clean, cheap, abundant and scalable 
electric power and industrial heat. It is passive work, very safe. The, the, the fuel cycles are very long. We have a superior fuel efficiency and is the cheapest and most efficient way to produce large quantity of green hydrogen. And then let's say hydrogen derivatives. So not only direct ship propulsion, but also a range of, let's say, floating plants and installations. And this is what we are considering because as, as Edmond highlighted, there is, let's say, a regulatory path that needs to be undertaken before we can have, let's say, nuclear power ships prowling the seas. We consider that the first, the first move will be to have floating powers, uh, floating stations like FPSOs, like producing green hydrogen and green ammonia with uh, molten salt reactors using as feedstock seawater, which is desalinated and extracting hydrogen, extracting nitrogen from air, and, and then combining them to create uh, green ammonia or then or using CO2 as feedstock to create green metal. Initially, this floating uh, production station would be, let's say, stationed in domestic waters. So without uh, complex, uh, let's say, international regulation, only abiding to national regula uh, regulations, and possibly starting with US, UK, EU, or, or Japan. And as we know, the, the demand for synthetic green fuel is, is supposed to skyrocket, and we need a massive amount of energy to be able to produce them. And the only way is to have an industrial possibility of producing them. So to use viable renewable energy like wind and solar is okay, but it's not okay by itself if used alone. We need to provide a dispatchable power source that can provide power 24 seven to ensure that the production is continuous. If we consider ship propulsion alone, we have to understand that the possibility of installing fourth generator advanced atomic initially will be restricted to the large segment of, of the fleet, and which is also the, the hardest to be decarbonized. So it's, it's a perfect match. So if we consider a cape size carrying 180,000 tons of iron ore from Brazil to China with different, let's say, uh, fueling or, or, or powering alternatives, we see that the amount of fuel, heavy fuel that is burned in a trip and voyage is about short of 40 of, of 4,000 tons. In case of, of ammonia, it will be short of 9,000 tons. If we consider uh, uh, an, uh, an, uh, a nuclear reactor, I mean, the, the amount of fuel needed for the entire voyage is, is just over one kilogram. And if we look at the, the, the right column, the emissions, again, the direct emissions in, in terms of CO2 are short of 12,000 tons in case of heavy fuel oil, 90 tons in case of green ammonia and just one kilogram in case of, of the nuclear reactor because it's, it's the amount of fuel that we are using during the trip and then we will have to, let's say, reprocess at the end of the, life, uh, at the end of the lifetime of the reactor. Aside from the uh, direct, let's say, cost advantages, we also have other advantages. The fact that uh, there will be no volatility in the cost of the fuel. And also since the life cycle cost of the vessel will be lower, the vessel will be able to trade at higher speed. So there will be also additional advantages for the charters. It will be no longer necessary to sail at economic speed, but the ships, the nuclear power ships will be able to sail at a design speed for mostly the entire life. There are also other options that we can tap into. 
using a nuclear power. And these are floating plants. For instance, I mean, floating power plants, uh, one has already been, let's say, commissioned by the Russian, even though it uses, let's say, standard pressurized water reactor. And this could provide electric power uh, from the sea to shore for, for industrial usage. Because I mean, this, this requirement of energy requirement for decarbonization are not only for the sea, but also for, let's say, onshore industry. And uh, the reason of moving from land to shore to sea is that nuclear reactors have just one single drawback, which is the need for a heat sink. Because when we use a diesel engine, we use the atmosphere as a heat sink. We basically release hot exhaust gases. With a nuclear reactor, we need a heat sink. And if we move to the sea, we immediately have at our disposal an infinite heat sink, which makes things, let's say, very practical and safe. Another option could be floating mobile desalination plants. We know that potable water is more of a scarce resource, it's more and more. And we can envision floating plants, again, FPSO-like, that with nuclear power, they produce electric power and dispatch it to shore, but they also desalinate water and produce fresh water for irrigation or for human consumption. And all these type of vessel will be non-IMO vessel type operating either under national uh, regulations or under UNCLOS. So I thank you very much and I look forward to an interesting debate. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's start with, uh, with uh, Julio because you, uh, you have some figures in your presentation. You mentioned the, the, the case of the, of the Cape. In the case of the Cape, you mentioned 3,500 tons of fuel at the price of $350 a day, that's 1.3 million. But you said the equivalent with the atomic fuel is what? 1.1 kilo times yeah, yeah, I mean, we, we cannot do a direct CAPEX, OPEX comparison between yeah. nuclear and, and non-nuclear, because as we know, um, shipping is used to very low CAPEX, quite high OPEX model, while nuclear, basically all costs are up front, okay? So this is... If you, let's say, if you try and make a comparison within, let's say, an operating profile of a Cape, to put it in that sense, in a 20, 25, now the average, the average age of the ships before they, they've been recycled is approximately 20 to 22 years, depending on the, on the ship type, but this is more or less. I mean, what's the CAPEX plus OPEX comparison uh, for the atomic versus, let's say, the conventional, the VLFSO? At, at which carbon tax? Okay, let's, you, you, you do the math. No. I mean, I'm asking, no. No. Is, so, let's say with, with... is it lower, significantly lower, higher? Where, I'm, I'm not asking for, you know, dollars yes. or anything. Just give us an indication. Okay, so uh, as of now, without carbon taxation, uh, for, for a CAPE, uh, we are about 10% lower, okay? It, it really depends on the size of the ship and, and on, let's say, on, 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 the, on, the, on the operating profile. But in general, I mean, the best uh, advantages can be reaped with large container ships, where we can even be, let's say, 30% less expensive in respect to the total life cycle cost. And of course, for small ships like, uh, like Panamax, uh, there, there is basically very little advantage, if any, as of now. But yeah. as carbon taxation will be rolled out, things will change in this respect. We'll see about the carbon taxation because we hear figures that in the, you know, in, in some exorbitant sphere, because uh, as you said, I think, uh, I think you said it in your presentation, it's, we're talking about 1 billion tons of CO2. If you add the price to that, let's say one hundred dollars per ton, I mean, per, that would give you, let's say, approximately uh, one hundred billion per annum. That's the tax. That's a huge price. Imagine that the total, the total estimated value of the global fleet is in the range of one trillion 
1.2 trillion. So that's a huge cost. We'll see where it where it stands with the, when everything settles down with with the tax. Now, specifically about the infrastructure, uh, you said you have the fuel up, uh, you know, up, up, up front. Meaning, how about security and commercial issues? Who pays the fuel? Now, the model in CPEC is that charterer may pay the fuel. So, in that sense, if you have the fuel, how the charterer is going to be engaged? And how about security? You have nuclear uh, material on board the ship, and that may necessitate some sort of additional security provisions, because no one will, give, will you know, no one will will allow you. To, to go across the globe without any sort of security because it might be stolen or anything. What about these practical considerations? Okay, so uh, let's say security first. As we said, one of the most important uh, features of a molten salt reactor is that it doesn't need to be fueled for a very long time, okay? And uh, our goal uh, is that if we create a, a slightly larger reactor, but we, we use it at a slightly lower power, we can ex extend the lifetime of the reactor to the entire lifetime of the ship. This allows us to create a sealed, self-enclosed reactor that cannot be tampered with, okay? So basically there will be no handling of fresh or spent nuclear material in port whatsoever. And this, let's say, kills the proliferation issues and the security issue. Okay? How about the commercial? Excuse me? The commercial. Okay, so from the commercial point, uh, uh, sorry, I, I don't recall uh, the, the question that you are asking. Can you repeat? The question was, now the model we have in shipping is that charter ah, yes. for the fuel, especially for specific, I mean, for, for most of the projects, if you are time charter, if you are a spot, sure. that's enough. But again, this is the model we have been used to. The charter pays for the fuel. How about this commercial model is, is applied to the to the nuclear uh, option? Okay, uh, we are considering a, a long-term power purchase agreement. Okay, so this long-term uh, power purchase agreement consider both, let's say, the capex plus let's say the fuel consumption. So there will be provision within the long-term uh, power purchase agreement for the, the charterer to pay to the owner in respect of the usage of the fuel, which can be metered because we know how much power we extract from the reactor because it's, it's measured in, in real time. And so it can be charged to the charter. But of course there will be a cost up front that will be, let's say, paid by, by the, the ship owners with, let's say, monthly installations throughout the life of the vessel. Okay, Panos, let's hear from you. How about what sort of barriers you see? Because there are some barriers from your perspective, absolutely, especially the CapEx is high. What sort of barriers you see towards accepting that technology in the market? And maybe which type of ships may be more, let's say, fit uh, to this model? Very, very, very relevant questions, but I also want to touch a little bit on the previous questions. Absolutely, absolutely. Because yeah. one of the models that I see as far as the commercial issue would be a leasing plan. In other yeah. words, the owner will lease the reactor from the manufacturer and therefore he will be paying uh, yeah. by by the month. It's and, that is, and that is how you can share the cost with the charter. Um, uh, and now, uh, another thing is you have to uh, keep in mind that in a few years, your laptops are going to be powered by nuclear batteries. I don't know if you have heard that, okay? Still radio, some radioactivity in there. So this is where we're going. Now, uh, uh, oh, another calculation I made is that the Panamax, over its lifetime, with a, with a $450 uh, per ton of fuel, uh, the, the total expenditure is over a hundred million dollars just yeah. for the fuel over the lifetime. Of course, I don't know really what what Julio uh, figures uh, he has in mind as far as 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 uh, the cost of a reactor, but I have heard some pretty low figures, like below twenty million, from some people who deal with this in other projects. Because we have we have to say that there are six major projects going on right now in the world with, with different 
uh, uh, technologies. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, to your question, the barrier. Uh, people, people say that uh, the public may not accept it. And um, uh, some other people uh, reply to this that uh, the, the first explosion that we're going to have from a ship burning hydrogen then, then uh, uh, people are not going to be accepting hydrogen because hydrogen is very explosive. Um, so so I, I think people are smart. Once they see that this is safe and this has no connection with present uh, uh, nuclear power, they will accept it. My fear is that uh, we might have political uh, 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 resistance, not so much resistance from the public, for example, the big oil majors and things like that who are going to see, uh, uh, for example, a big portion uh, of their of their uh, clientele leaving. Now, on your question about um, practically, I take it, what would you do? Uh, uh, different possibilities. I'm a naval architect. If you come to me and tell me you have unlimited power, forget about fuel, diesel engines and all that and design a ship for me. You know, the first idea that would come to my mind, a huge hovercraft. Why? So you don't need ports. The hovercraft, you just need the flat area. Would go on land, would go into a flat area where you can have cranes, unload, load, whatever. She goes back into, into the sea. The possibilities that are open are, are, are really new and we have to start thinking out of the box, but I, I I think this is where we're going anyways. Um, yeah, yeah, I understand that. Edmund, uh, what's your take? What sort of barriers you see? Panos highlight the number of issues. What, what sort of barriers do you see? Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, public perception is obviously one, but I, I, I believe that that is changing to some degree. I think, I think, uh, I think the, you know, as the risks of climate change become more acute, frankly, um, you know, and they will do. They're going to come more acute. They're, people are going to have to change their attitudes, and and that that will take leadership. It will take leadership, political leadership. Uh, we're seeing some of that already in some of the governments around the world that are showing, telling people, look, we're willing to invest in this technology because we see that this is part of the future, and we need it. You know, we need it for baseline energy, for for just power. You know, and 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 I think when people start being you know presented the the, the, the you know the, the possibilities both the opportunities and I, I do take on the point of view of panel so I think it's got huge possibilities here just in shipping you know we've got ships that won't need to be refueled we've got we've got you know the, from a commercial point of view considering you know we've got no idea of where the future fuels are going to necessarily come from and the cost you talked about cost of infrastructure well you know th th some studies have shown it's going to be between one and 1.4 trillion dollars to invest in the in the infrastructure i mean where's that money going to come from i mean i i, I personally i i just think we have to have this grown-up conversation to sort of look at where this energy is going to come from for our sector and and this is a real part of that solution and i and i think it does present lots of possibilities i think from the public's point of view particularly they have to recognize that that, that they're going to get squeezed eventually you know we've lived through a hundred years of, of of you know hydrocarbon fuels which have enabled our societies to develop and grow and become evolve the way they have now we can't deny that opportunity to developing countries for a start so politically that needs to be addressed and at the same time if we're not going to want uh, fuels to become uh, you know prohibitively expensive for uh, the general public you know again that has to be addressed and, and i take the point about the politics from the from the from the the, the large majors and the oil majors well they as we know are already uh, positioning and changing their investment strategies because they're under pressure from their shareholders to change and, and we can see that in the in the markets that there, there's a huge amount of pressure now for companies to to change their, their whole strategy and their whole and in fact many of these companies now talk about being energy companies and part of the energy frankly part of that, i can see you know small, small companies like core power potentially being bought out eventually by larger companies who want to plug, plug their flag on the nuclear territory because it's going to be it's going to come it's going to come maybe yeah uh, now, uh, as we have to speed up our discussion, uh, Julio, what sort of uh, milestones do you expect in the near future to see the technology progress? When do you see the first ship? We've seen this uh, ship you, you mentioned. Where do you see when the first ship I mean, be supplied with such, a, such an option and to have something practical to share with the industry? What are the next milestones you, you, you're thinking? <laughs> 
So the, the first milestone will be, let's say, the, the prototype around 2024. Mm -hmm. And we consider having, let's say, the first, let's say, uh, full-scale demonstrators uh, out by 2027, 2028. So there will be a series of, let's say, full-scale uh, reactor uh, installed in uh, floating uh, plants, either to produce power uh, or to create, let's say, green hydrogen desalination, mm -hmm. possibly in uh, U.S. coastal waters, because this is where we are, let's say, the technology is being developed. And uh, ships uh, will start, uh, let's say, trading under UMCLOS uh, when we will have several, uh, at least two nations that have, would have developed this type of floating plants in their own coastal waters. And so without, let's say, IMO, uh, ab needing to abide to IMO regulation, they could, under bilateral agreement, ships could trade between these two nations, nuclear ships could trade between the, these nations. The, the, the last, let's say, uh, uh, open, let's say, trading pattern under IMO will come after several nations will have started, let's say, using this technology in coastal water and for trading under nations. Okay. Now, as we have to conclude the panel, I'd like to ask you to sum up your thoughts. We have the issues of the, the Green Deal in Europe, talking about carbon neutral by 2050. We have this decarbonization challenge that we have to solve. IMO 2020 has been seamlessly, I would say, implemented across the industry. As we move forward, uh, what are your thoughts? What are the, the things you expect to see to have this technology becoming not necessarily mainstream, but to have the technology, I mean, gaining weight across the industry? What are your thoughts or maybe what are your wish list panels? You are muted. You are muted. One great possibility I see is the uh, huge and unlimited production of alternative fuels that we need. For example, uh, you can have big quantities of green hydrogen using this. And uh, hydrogen is not easy to use on board the ship, but methanol is. If you add CO2 to hydrogen, you get methanol and water, okay? So if this hydrogen is green, you have a perfect fuel, okay, in unlimited quantities for shipping. So it's not only the nuclear power itself, it's, it's all the other benefits that it can bring. Okay. Edmund, your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I think just echoing that really, I mean, I think if, if, if we're going to go down a solution of using liquid fuels on the ship as opposed to direct nuclear propulsion, then again, it's, you know, those within the industry need to really start advocating for that solution mm -hmm. in totality, i.e. the life cycle, not just sort of talking about the fuel on the vessel and, and then sort of, you know, not discounting the life cycle, but actually sort of having to consider that as part of the solution. And I think that's very important. If we, and that's very important to communicate to the decision makers, i.e. the governments, who frankly have set, thrown down the gauntlet, set this challenge for the sector, and it's up to the governments now to find the solution uh, as much as the stakeholders within the sector to try and help them and support them to achieve that. And, and we know that that is, that is key part of this, is that communication and that collaboration. So that's really what I would echo. Oh, and by the way, I must say, Apostolos, thank you very much, Group Safety for C, for giving the opportunity to have this discussion. I think it's a very important one and, and frankly is often missing from many, many of the conferences and webinars that I, I see. Uh, it really needs to happen, so thank you. Uh, th thank you for that. I think this year we've made a tremendous effort to provide, a, let's say, an extended program. We have this two-day event. Uh, may, having the event virtual makes it easier for us to attract better panelists because there's no travel involved. And in some cases, we have this challenge because in the live events, we have to have the, the panelists live in Athens. So it, it's easier for us. Anyway, I, I think we've done, a, we've done some, some tremendous effort trying to, to compile some, some sort of meaningful panels and meaningful discussions. And we'll see how it goes. Julia, your thoughts in order to, to sum up and you know, close the, the panel? Well, I would say that uh, in the decarbonization scenario, atomic power is uh, the biggest enabler. So there is uh, no way that we can decarbonize the world, not only for climate change reasons, but also to reduce pollution, mortality and morbidity. There is no better way than advanced atomics. Uh, the technology that we are pursuing 
doesn't have any regulatory or technical showstopper. We we are moving forward, and I mean the world will will follow. I mean if people, if the governments, if the regulatory body, if the public opinion understand the advantages and start thinking uh, ahead, looking ahead, forgetting about I mean what has it's a held them behind the fears often misguided about nuclear power. Well, this is a new form, an advanced form, which is even cleaner and safer than the, let's say, old school nuclear power is. And this is the only way that we can use if we want to create cheap, clean, and abundant power. And a modern world society needs power. We cannot solve modern world problems using old world technology. We need to look forward and to move forward. Absolutely. And I think that also echoes what Panos said in his last statement. We have to think differently now. And every option is on the table. You have to think with, with a clear mind and on a clear ship. Uh, Having said that, gentlemen, I would like to thank you very much for taking the time to join us in this panel. I would like to thank all our viewers. And uh, uh, we look forward to seeing you in one of our future events. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. It was thank a you pleasure. Very much. Thank Bye -bye. you. Stay ahead.